Good morning. It's wonderful to see so many people here. Um, can you hear me all right through the, the mic? Good distance. On behalf of Ann Arbor Friends Meeting, I welcome you to, the, to this memorial meeting for our beloved friend, Max Hyrick, a member of our meeting. I want to say a few words about a Quaker memorial meeting, in particular the part that in your program is labeled open worship with sharing out of the silence. In the tradition of the Religious Society of Friends, the memorial meeting is a meeting for worship in which we are gathered in reverent silence and anyone may speak as spirit leads to offer a prayer or a remembrance, leaving time for silent reflection between messages. A friend's memorial meeting is not a service of mourning, but a time for celebrating the deceased and the meaning of his life. A time for sharing memories, both solemn and joyful, which may make us cry or laugh. A time for feelings of loss, but also a time of thankfulness for the life of the deceased. A time for reflecting on how his life relates to all of our lives. Because this is a large room and because we are recording, we will need to use microphones. When you wish to speak, please stand. And Catherine and Bill, who are here somewhere, um, will bring a microphone to you. We expect that many of you will be moved to share. Please bear that in mind when offering your message. What we take away today may be a collage of verbal snapshots from the wide range of people whose lives Max touched. When the time seems appropriate, <clears throat> I will signal Colby Maddox to sing the final song, and then we will all shake hands with our neighbors, bringing the meeting to a close. After the memorial meeting, all of us are invited to a reception in the social hall, where we hope you will continue to share memories. On your way there, if, please sign the guest book if you've not done so already. And now it's time to sing, and Julia Hyrick is, is going to introduce the songs.
Thank you all for being with us today. As you see, we've got a short list of songs we're hoping everyone will sing with us. We will have Cynthia Bogan will support us on the piano. And I just wanted to give a very brief introduction to explain to you why we chose each of these songs in regards to Max, to my father. Simple Gifts is a song that most Quakers sing even if, if the origins aren't from Quakers. It's a Shaker tune, not strictly Quaker. Because it talks of simplicity, which was a very strong theme in Max's life, something very important to him. Every Time I Feel the Spirit is a reference to his own spiritual seeking, which was his leading light all through his life. Very, very important. Study War No More is a very obvious reference if you read the obituary to the fact that Max was the first conscientious objector, objector in Muskogee, Oklahoma, or in the state of Oklahoma, I believe. And um, he's got the whole world in his hands, speaks of inclusiveness, which was also very important to him, to have everyone take part in everything. I uh, will introduce the last song afterwards. <laughs>
Thank you. There'll be more participation in the next one, which is a very special song for us, for the family. We're remembering with great love how Max, our father, used to sing the cantor verse of God is Love in the Father Rivers Mass. This was a special request from the family. And there's a group of brave souls who are going to join me and my mother to sing the cantor part, because no one wants to do it by themselves. <laughs> but afterwards, please, all of you, join in for the, the refrain, for the congregation's verse. laughing because he'd say, but of course, Aaron, you're going to go first. I woke up with a poem in my heart by Langston Hughes. My friend has gone away. I miss him. There's nothing more to say. My friend has gone away. The poem ends as sweetly as it began. So I just feel like giving Max a shout out for how he affected all of us and the good that he brought to us. And it was my joy to know him and to have time with him. So it feels like, you know, give it up there to Max and say thank you so much. And I thank this whole Hyrick family. I really appreciate it. And I will give a special shout out to Sophia, the caregiver here. <laughs> she was so beautiful with Max. And then, you know, Aaron and Cassie and, and anyway, thank you, thank you all. It's sort of like, it was kind of like a village, but that's Max's spirit that kept him going all that time. But that was just, just a joy, so thank you. All of you into Max. So I can, <clears throat> I can imagine uh, Max uh, whispering in the ear of Pope Francis this week when he met with <laughs> President Trump. <laughs> and, um, and if there ever was a saint next to 
Pope Francis, it would be Max. Uh, I'm chair of the Interfaith uh, Power and Light Michigan. Uh, and know even until the very last how much that meant to him. So many areas of justice, as I read his obituary, but environmental justice and for a cleaner, healthy, and more just world was certainly a burning passion for him. Uh, I have a grandson whose name is Max, and that word means great. Um, and he defined great the way I would hope my grandson would be too, in terms of his gentleness, his quiet spirit, and his steadfastness for things that matter deeply to him. My name's Jeff, Jeff Baker, and I go a long ways back with the Hyrick family. The corner of Manor Drive and Hillsdale in the Northside School neighborhood was a focus of activity. There were a bunch of intelligent parents who moved in with young kids, and we played stickball and risk and candy canes and I remember going over to the Hyrex house and Max would be in the living room looking back out in the woods talking about something inter interesting. Jane would be making authentic corn chips in the kitchen and it was a wonderful environment to grow up with. So I have many fond memories of Max and the rest of the Hyrex family and due to Facebook, Alan, I got reconnected because we recognized pictures with each other. So people like Max are a blessing to the world. Thank you. Even though I haven't had quite enough of life experience to say this quite yet, but having Max as a grandparent was just incredible, and I, I truly, truly am grateful for having such a mentor in my life. I am interested in pursuing sort of the same thing that he did, and I'm so, so grateful to have someone like that in front of me to look up to, and I'm, I'm just incredibly, incredibly happy that he used his life in such a meaningful, productive way. As we gather uh, this morning, a deep and long-time friend of Max's is sitting with us in Victoria, British Columbia. And Robert Oppenheimer sent this message, poem for Max. So many years of friendship, so many moments of deep connection, the walks together in nature as we shared our stories, the tapestry of our lives unfolding in conversations over the years knowing we could always count on one another for unconditional support, knowing we would each be there no matter what. It is all so vivid in my mind. I still feel your presence here with me as I write these words. I feel so blessed to have shared this journey with you and to call you my friend. I, uh... There are so many things that you can remember about a friend. I, I lived uh, in Max's home for a couple of years, and uh, one of the things that I look forward to uh, is when he would come home. He would, on a Sunday after a friend's meeting, uh, <laughs> he would sit at the piano and he'd play Bach. And, uh, I so loved that, basically, and uh, it changed uh, my day, basically. Uh, I think that uh, it was a time for him of uh, reflection and hope, and uh, for me personally, I think that uh, hope was a gift, and uh, I certainly wanted to share that with you. And, I hope that the family and his friends keep that hope. You know, I think that was a motivating factor in his life was hope and a desire, an absolute desire for justice, and which he believed was possible in this world. And uh, I thank you for giving me the opportunity to say this to all of you very much. Thank you. It's nice meeting you. I just want to say I have a really funny memory. I was like, I was little, and um, at my school we always had we always had a Halloween party, and um, Grandpa Max came, and then he we didn't he didn't have a costume, and me and my sister were horrified that he didn't have a costume, and so we made him a costume, 
and it was really, really cheap, but he appreciated it, and it was nice that he was just willing to go along with anything his grandkids wanted, and he was just a really fun guy. Good morning. I, along with others, are polarity therapists in the community of Ann Arbor, and Max is the person that got John Bowdery to get us all involved in polarity, which is an energy balancing system. And it's because of Max and John getting together that we've all grown into the community that we've grown into. And it's actually changed my life. I look at life different. I appreciate life more. And I just want to thank Max for working with John and sending John to all of us. We have a lot of, of our community here today representing us. And I just want to thank Max because I never would have experienced any of what I experienced if it hadn't been for Max. Thank you. I'm a colleague of Max's at the Residential College. And um, I just wanted to um, thank him for his always present interest and concern and care for his younger colleagues. He was always interested in what I was doing. He was very supportive of my work. Uh, I direct plays and he came to many of them uh, and was just always warm and connected uh, every time I saw him. And I will miss him greatly. So let's see if I can get through this. Um, my name is Mike and I've known Max for oh, over 30 years. Um, and I just want to acknowledge what everybody I judge in this room knows already. I have never experienced unconditional love as I have with Max. And as a tribute to him, is in that 30 years, I really can't think of one person that continuously I have thought of. He has continuously been a gentle and powerful reminder of looking at my life, how can I give of my life, how can I grow in my life, and how can I best reflect the gifts of God. I, um, we were blessed, it was by accident. We uh, came through um, following uh, a trip and um, spent an, an afternoon about a month before he, uh, before he passed and uh, giving him massage and just being with him. And um, um, once again, you know, um, just absolutely incredibly sweet, which is one of my favorite words. Just incredibly sweet, this man's life and what he bestowed on so many people. My name is John. Uh, Max taught me the work that I do. And it seemed to me the one thing I learned from him was not the work. When I would come to work on him in Ann Arbor, the first thing out of his mouth every time was, how are you? I thought, I'm here to work on you. I'm here to do my thing with you, and your biggest concern is, how are you? And that's what Max taught me. Don't always be in here. Be concerned about who's out there and what they need. Thank you. I just want to add to what John had to say. I think that I only remember one face-to-face -face meeting with Max. But I knew Max, and Max knew me. And the second thing often that Max would ask John is, how is Carol? And by that little antidote, I want to say that I, I chose to speak because I want to witness to everyone here that Max's effect went way beyond just those who had a face-to-face -face contact with him. I know that he was a man of God, and his love goes throughout the world. 
So I've come to know Max only recently as he served with a number of us here on the Michigan Interfaith Power and Light Board. And I shared this with the board, but I realized what a strong visual image I carry of this. And that is, um, I went to visit Max one day at his house. And this is just in recent months. And there was such a nice, peaceful vibe around the house. The caregiver was there. He reminded me so much of my dad and it's very near the end of his life when, when dad's world got small. Not in a bad way, it just got small. And by this time, Max's world was that little kitchen table. And so we had a cup of tea. And there was just, the word authenticity comes to mind because there was such an ease about Max and such a centeredness, a gracefulness for whatever discomfort, whatever physical limitations, it did not shape his outlook and who you experienced. In the visual memory that stays with me, in, he wanted to get this book. And, it, and it, it took about six or eight steps with his walker and he had to get down these two steps to get to where the book was and then, and then there was, there was no hint of discomfort, of frustration. It was simply something to do. And I felt like I was witnessing this beautiful spirit of life. Um, and, and when you said I've known him 30 years, I feel like I know Max, just in that short experience with him. And in the essence and peacefulness and ease with which he was in the world. About, <clears throat> about 20 years ago, when Max was just recovering from major heart surgery, he asked me to drive him to Livonia to go look at these very, very snazzy chairs that were very easy to get up from the chair, very comfortable to sit in, you could sit and read. And they were a little expensive. And Max had such a struggle because he felt he really didn't deserve that kind of a chair. And of course, after we purchased the chair, he was so happy to have it. And every time I'd go see him in his house, he would get off the chair and say, no, no, you have to sit in the chair. <laughs> My message is twofold. Um, the first is just to affirm within wider Quaker circles how difficult it is to uh, not find six degrees of separation, friends who knew Max. Just a couple of weeks ago, we were at a retreat in New York Yearly Meeting, and in addition to Ken and I, there were three friends there who knew Max. Um, and, and we also bring, so we bring greetings from those friends, and also greetings from Rochester Meeting, where um, David Bassett of Ann Arbor meeting is, um, is now uh, living with us. But the memory, the memory that's coming, I thought back to my earliest memory of Max. In 1973, I was a very young freshman at the residential college in a class that has since become legendary called Alternative Realities. And I remember Max on the stage of the RC Auditorium with a small Mobius strip made out of brown paper. It was about this big. And he took his scissors and he cut it lengthwise. And lo and behold, it doubled. And then he did it again. And it doubled again. And soon the strip was the width of the auditorium stage. I don't at all remember why, why we were having that particular lesson. Um, but it strikes me that it, it says so much about Max in the ways in which he had so many interests, so many adventures. The stories he told were just amazing. And it seemed like he, it always just made his, his spirit grow bigger. I think it's, it's worth saying 
that um, at the age of seven or even earlier, um, Max dedicated his life to God and to service. Um, this is a story I've heard from Max oh, many times, and um, it's worth, worth taking into consideration. It was soon after we moved to Ann Arbor that a friend of mine made reference to a class that she had been in, taught by Max. It may have been this legendary class, I don't know. But she was very moved by a small gesture of kindness that he did in that class when a student made reference to the existentialist French philosopher as Camus. And rather than correcting the pronunciation in front of the class, he simply turned to the blackboard and wrote it, uh, wrote the name on the, the blackboard and proceeded. That's such a gentle way of making sure that there was no embarrassment and that everybody knew that who that student was talking about. Uh, for me personally, his lifetime of leadership in matters of health and well-being, um, I am so grateful to him for the leadership he took within our friends' meeting to bring information about a new Aging in Place program that he ended up becoming a member of. Uh, and without his conviction that this new program that was relatively untested, certainly here in the Midwest, without his conviction that the intentions and the commitment and the future of this program were worthy we probably would not have joined, and I am just incredibly grateful for his, his leadership and his trust in others. Hi, um, my name is Lisa Sennett. I'm joined here by um, my daughters, Nora and Diane, who Max um, knew and loved since before they were born. My partner, Steve, who Max came to care for in our friends, too, from our meeting. Um, I was Max's student in 1987, and also his housemate. I got to help um, transcribe and part an interview about his um, life in the civil rights movement and some wonderful stories about his family. Um, I've written a lot about the many things that Max has done for me, and so um, I wrote a little something just I knew I wouldn't be able to say it or remember. <laughs> Dearest Max, you are my friend, my true friend, our dear friend. I feel permission, acceptance to stop running, hiding, fighting. Your love for me and for us was a resting place a welcoming as such I <clears throat> had never known, nuanced and intelligent, deep and clear as water, filling and cleansing. Some will say God, the Holy Spirit. For me, our love was held in the spirit, and this is a poem by Wendell Berry, to the Holy Spirit, O thou, Far off in here, whole and broken, who in necessity and bounty wait, whose truth is both light and dark, mute though spoken, by thy wide grace, show me thy narrow gate. Max, I love you, and we will always hold you in the light. Good morning. I did not intend to speak today. I came to listen and to learn. But I think you should know that over 50 years ago, I met Max and his family. We were in student housing in Berkeley, California. And I want you to know that my daughters, my two older daughters, Claudia and Andrea, send their greetings to Alan and Douglas because 
they bonded at a very early age. We all went our different directions, and we all had different careers, experiences, but one never forgets a friendship with the Heyrich family. My love to Jane, to her family, and thank you for sharing Max with us. I was one of Max's students, and I have more than a few stories that I could tell, but I will keep it to one or two. And um, I'll never forget just how welcoming and how kind Max was. Um, I was kind of the truly non-traditional student, chronically ill with Crohn's disease and having dyslexia, trying to get through a PhD program, and Max was my chair, and he believed in me. But I'll never forget, after he had endocarditis and he was in the hospital over at St. Joe's, he called me and he said, I'm bored. Bring me three chapters of your dissertation. And, <laughs> oh wait, even better. And a whole box, all 12 red pens. <laughs> and I thought to myself, I'm screwed. Um, I got those papers back, and his handwriting was all over the place, slanted, of course, because he never wrote in a straight line. And it took me about two weeks to get through all of his comments. But he signed all of these criticisms with, best wishes, Max. <laughs> OK. He was my, Max was my mentor. He was my friend. He was my dissertation chair. And in many ways, he was like a father to me. Um, he was a parent to me. He knew that my family relationships were extremely strained, or are extremely strained, that I don't really have a family that I can depend on. And so he called me every few days. And shortly before he passed away, about a week before, he phoned me and he said, I think I'm ready to go. And I'm not scared now. And I want you to carry on the work that I began. And I love you. And that just made me cry and cry and cry. He was such a special man to me, and he still is in many, many ways. But I think right after his death, I cried a river, and I still cry from time to time. And one of my friends who was at Michigan with me she summed it up really well. And he said, she said, Max was a sea of kindness, a sea of humor, a sea of wisdom in a department of vipers and in a world <laughs> that just was unkind. So that's very true. And the final thing that Max said to me, the very last thing he said to me was, I'll be damned if I don't live to see Trump get out of office. There were so many things in Max's obituary in the newspaper that I didn't know about him, despite the fact that I spent um, scores of hours in his presence. Um, I don't know how many years we were uh, together almost every week because we were in Bible study together. Um, I told myself I was only going to come here and listen because there are pieces that um, are missing from my understanding. I have lived a, a life unlike anybody I know and I, it's an incredibly wide scope and Max has been at the top as far as anti-racism is concerned. I know enough about his life to know that he was not born anti-racist and that he worked very hard at it. Um, that made him incredibly special and I knew him in, in many different phases of his life. When I contracted um, prostate cancer, I shared it in that particular Bible study. It was about six years ago. And Max was the first one to come to me to speak with me about it. Um, he told me how he had made his decision with it and um, uh, left it to me to make mine. And mine was uh, very different. But I respected the way that he uh, came to me to speak and how openly he shared. One of the I'm going to say it's an amusing way um, our relationship carried forth was invariably he would ask me how my wife was doing 
And I would, and sometimes I would feel, you must have an awe that she can live with me. Uh, <laughs> but he, 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 he never, <laughs> he never said that directly. Well, he was such an incredibly loving person and unbelievably humble. If I had known some of the things I read in the newspaper, I would have interviewed him. And I really, I miss that piece so much right now. The last time I saw him, I went to see him on Sunday just before worship. And I don't know who held whose hand first, but we sat there for about 20 minutes with him with his eyes closed and me praying with him. And then when I had to leave and I stood up, um, I kissed him and I said, I love you, Max. And I know the Holy Spirit sent me to visit him. And I did something that I had never done before because I've been in the ministry for over 51 years now. But I shared after worship that if you want to see Max, you need to go and see him now. And uh, I've never shared anything like that because that's, one could say it was private. However, I knew the Holy Spirit was telling me to say it. And two people came to me and said, would it be for him or for us? That's an incredible question. And I hadn't considered that, because I hadn't considered sharing it. And I said, I think it would be for both, because he deserves to see you, and you deserve to see him. And he died um, four days later. Um, it's such a blessing to have seen him that late in his travels. That's enough. Uh, my name is Madeline, and uh, I remember the first time Max told me he was sick, and I think it might have even been 20 years ago, though that seems a very long time. And I ran into him at the farmer's market, and he told me, and he said that the doctors told him he would probably only live a year and a half if they didn't do what, he told, what they told him to do. And he decided he was going to do things his own way. And he had a deep feeling that he would live much, much, much longer because he had important things to do, but he wasn't sure. So he obviously could have written a book about all the things he learned, how to take care of himself um, without going the mainstream way. But what was ironic is I, I knew him as a teacher and a healer. And at the beginning, I had a very strange illness that at times made me want to take my own life. And he was somebody fighting and fighting and fighting to keep his life. And I saw that he wasn't keeping his life for himself. He saw his life as a gift, not just for himself, but that we live to give our life to others. And he would let me call him up at one or two in the morning. And I remember his gentle, gentle laugh. He would laugh always with me. And he's here right now laughing with us because we're talking in the past tense about him. And he's here. And so I'm just imagining his laughter thinking about how we're talking to, about him in the past tense. But anyway, I would call him in despair, and he would laugh. And he would say, essentially, oh, Madeline, there you are in the basement again. <laughs> well, it, I'm here in the living room still, and the sun is shining. And when you're ready, you can climb up the stairs. 
and come in the living room again. But I'll talk to you as long as you need to be in the basement. And all he needed to do was say that. I'm just symbolically talking about what he said. He never got involved in the stories about why I put myself in the basement. And frankly, I think it was just his laughter that would help me see how ridiculous I was going into the basement. Um, but his laughter alone, more than anything he ever said to me, saved uh, my life over and over and over again. And his laughter in and of itself taught me more than any profound book written by any prophet over the past 2,000 years because his laughter was the joy of life and the understanding at how rare a gift it is, how precious it is, and it is something we give to each other. It is not just something for us alone. I'm another one of those people who came here to listen. But I wanted to give voice to uh, the title of two courses that I took from Max. One was Western and Non-Western Medicine, and the other was Recent Paradigm Contenders in Social Science Theory, both mouthfuls. I uh, was a young activist uh, at U of M, and Max, I think, was the only professor who I went to for consultation or guidance about how, how we as, as a group of student activists should um, think about things. I like the word praxis, and uh, praxis is where theory meets action. And Max, I think, was brilliant at this. Um, uh, whatever the issue, he always had a way of saying, there's a way of bringing this together with this and this over here, and there's some potential here for something great to happen. Um, and it, it was always beautiful to see him present these ideas that he would have about how, how change could happen, and I'm grateful for that. Um, when I was, uh, well, this was probably about 10 years ago, uh, I, I was, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm a, a theater nut, and so I'm, I try to get on stage. And, um, and uh, about 10 years ago, uh, you know, I dyed my hair. Max came to me and said, do brunettes have more fun? Because <laughs> he noticed I was covering the gray, I think. But it was uh, just... An example, it, the thing that with Max was always the sparkle, was always there. But he shared with me something which I think is important that I should share with you. You might know this or might have. But he, we were talking one time and he said, he told me about spiritual experiences he had, very deep spiritual experiences and, and ecstasies. And, uh, and, and, um, and I forget how he put it, but it was kind of like he was saying, uh, um, and they were very important to him then, but he decided, or you know, it turned as it turns out, they're not that important. That's the feeling he gave me. I can't tell the words, and I and I was thinking about that, and and what he was trying to convey to me, and uh, I came across uh, in my mind the uh, story in the scriptures of. Uh, Christ on the, on the mountaintop with Moses and Abraham. 
And his disciples says, um, his disciples say, well, we'll make up breads and we can stay here. This is great, you know. And, uh, and I forget what the answer is in scripture, but you know, that's only partly, that's just part of the time. That the, the thing with Max for me was that, uh, put it this way, he wasn't selfless, but his self was just so big. that it included so much. About four years ago, I received a diagnosis that nobody wants. Max was our neighbor across the street on Broadway, and he reached out to me, and he helped me think about alternative remedies too. So I had him over to the house for tea. We did this several times. And um, we're an interracial, international adoptive family, and he loved that. He loved the pictures of the kids and the grandkids coming in and out of the house and all of that. And we're sitting in the living room, and we're talking about the meaning of life and how you find your way through hard times. And I mentioned to him that I considered myself still a, a practicing Catholic, and he looked stunned. He looked at me and he said, really? And I said, yeah. And he said, you don't sound like one. <laughs> and I said to him, you've been reading too much in the newspaper. <laughs> so I brought down from upstairs books about, by Elizabeth Johnson and Joan Chittister and Philip Roth. And he's glancing through them and they're all pretty left of center. And he looked at me and he said, isn't it great that we still have so much to learn? And I gave him a hug and I feel as if that moment was just fantastic. I'll never forget that. I'm Art Wolf. Uh, I'm privileged to know Max since 1952 when he was a senior at Earlham. I had a graduate year there at, year at Earlham, not a place you usually think of for graduate studies, but a, a, they had a special program that I was in. And Max and I became very good friends. Uh, we seemed to be kindred spirits with the same concerns about life and the world and what we should try to do in the future to make things better. And uh, Max, we stayed friends. Max was the usher at our wedding in 1954. And then we both ended up in Ann Arbor since 1967 when the Heyrich family joined us here in the friends meeting. Our kids grew up together in the meeting, uh, first day of school. And kind of fun to see them now. They look a little different than when I knew them. <laughs> but uh, through the years, Max has been a very dear friend and caring person that I really respect for all he has done for the world, and we will miss him. So I'm Ken, and um about 36 years ago, Max stood up in Ann Arbor meeting and said that they had an opening in their house for somebody. And somebody told me, and I went. He welcomed me. In fact, he told me that they had, he and Richard had had, uh, had the worship and had and tried to envision who they were looking for. And well, I was that. That was Max. He was an interesting man, complex. He told stories about himself, but they were never boasting. They were inviting you into a reality that he lived richly. And so I'm wondering what Max 
would invite us into now. Because he would. He'd be inviting us in to some new reality. And it comes to me that, though well, I'm sure he never said this to me, the reality he lived out of was an intent to heal. And I'm wondering if that's a reality we can live into. It's bigger than protecting. It's bigger than making right. It's bigger than fixing. This is holding an intent to make things heal, however that might be. And knowing we can't really do that, but if we hold that intent, what will happen? I lived in Max's household also for several years, uh, but I think I, in some ways, got to know him better and on a deeper level. Late, very late in his life when he was really, really concerned about the environment and doing much of his um, continued activism on environmental issues. Um, I remember in particular uh, going with him on a delegation um, that was sponsored and organized by Michigan Interfaith Power and Light um, to Lansing to talk to lobby on some energy efficiency and energy renewable energy bills. And at that point, he was mostly using a wheelchair because he just didn't have the energy to walk around from place to place. So I would push the wheelchair and we would go and visit whoever the representative's uh, staff person was. Um, and so t I was, when we, I was helping to plan this memorial service, um, I realized that we wouldn't be able to wash dishes and the idea of disposable dishes disturbed me. It just didn't seem like what Max would be happy with. And so I made it, um, I felt moved to myself to uh, purchase compostable dishes, uh, plates, um, cups, and napkins. And so I will urge you to help us really compost them by putting them in the green bags and anything else you want to throw away, put in the black bags. Max touched a lot of people here. And his life and his career went many different directions. There are a couple things, though, that I see and I hear from all of you. They were true throughout all of his journey. That he always took a strong belief in fairness, equality, justice. He also had a playful side. You know, besides wanting to make the world a better place, he also was willing to travel through it just open to see what would happen. I remember winter of 79, 80. He had some free time, he had a sabbatical, he wasn't quite sure what to do. He decided to go on a journey. He ended up, got, got a ride with a friend from you know, Michigan to West Coast. And I think it took him about 20 hours to get there in a car. And he got out and stuck his thumb out and wanted to hitchhike. And then, you know, 10 minutes later, two of his friends are driving south to you know, Santa Barbara. And they give him a ride. They have an adventure along the way. And then I get a call saying, like, hey, I'm at the bus station. Can I come stay with you? You know, I don't have any, I don't have any plans. Unfortunately, I had to say no because I already had a friend sleeping underneath the dining room table. <laughs> there was really no more space. But he had other friends in the neighborhood, and so a couple blocks up the beach, he was able to find a garage and a space next to an old MG. And he stayed there for uh, more than a month while he had adventures in Los Angeles. And he'd, get, he'd meditate, he'd get up, he'd leave, you know, leave his garage and go out in the day. Uh, some days would be on public radio giving a lecture. Other days it would just you know, be going to museums. But you know, while I remember, his passion for justice, and I take that for all my life. I'll never forget that. I'm a great example. I also, you know, when I can remember it, try and remember that light, that light spirit, which held the whole world with light, as well as everyone that he met. Hi, I'm Max's other son, Alan. <clears throat> and uh, I was thinking about what I wanted to say on the plane here, and I'm afraid I came up with quite a few things. <laughs> so I'm going to try to keep only the best ones if I, my phone will work here. It's not cooperating. Come on. So 
when we were little, we lived in Berkeley. Max was in graduate school. He would bring home books from the library and read to us the stories of St. George and the Dragon. He told us stories about characters that he made up, Ringtail Bobcat and Red Fox, and these were great stories. He could go on and on about their adventures. When I was a few years older, I tried to write my own stories about these characters, but they were never as good as the stories that Max told us. Max understood that our cats were people and that their feelings mattered, and this made him different than most adults. When I was in high school, Max seemed like the most magical person I had ever met. Um, years later, I understood that this was partly because of the way he told stories, that he could make very ordinary things sound very magical. But despite this, he was very magical. Um, he introduced me to Eastern spiritual teachers who eventually became very important to me. Um, I was very fascinated by all of this sort of stuff. Um, one time, a Vedic astrologer from India came to Ann Arbor and was doing astrology charts on people, and apparently, according to Max, was telling people amazing things that they were astonished by. And he told Max that he would live to be at least 84 years old. Max was 85 when he died, and he'd be 86 if he were here today. One time I saw Max, when I was in my 20s, I was living apart from him, and didn't see him all that often. And after we parted, I felt overcome with waves of love pouring through me. It was really extraordinary. And I realized that these were coming from Max, that this was the love that he had for me, and that I've never felt that kind of love from anyone else, uh, ever. Max worked with recovering addicts in Detroit. Um, one day, he loaned his car to one of the women that he worked with, and she disappeared with it for six or eight months. And I guess she had never had a car before, and so it was impossible to resist the, the opportunity. So Max never reported the car stolen to the police. Uh, and eventually, after about a year, she came back and returned the car. <laughs> Sometimes people took advantage of Max because he was too trusting, and that was hard to see. Um, he didn't have the usual boundaries, and in some ways he didn't know how to be a conventional father. And there were times when I was disappointed by that. And I spent a number of years feeling upset about that and distant from him. But I'm glad that I finally got over that and had the opportunity to get to know him as a friend in his later years and uh, realize that you can't expect to get everything from your parents. He once said to me, I hope you don't think I'm a flake after I've gone. And I thought, I don't feel that way about you, Max. For a while, I lived in a meditation ashram in Ann Arbor on Hill Street, and uh, Max had introduced me to the place. And um, there was an Indian lady there named Ormi Bhatt, who uh, was a traditional Indian sadhaka. Her mother had been considered a saint in India, at least that's what her family said. Uh, and Ormi was very unusual herself. Um, one day, Ormi and I were cleaning beans in the dining room, and we were sitting by the bay windows that looked over the driveway, and Max came to visit me. He came walking down the driveway. And Ormi stood up out of her chair and she said, who is that old man? And I said, that's my father. And she said, that old man is your father? And her eyes were as big as dinner plates. And she said, he is so high. He is so high. So she was, <laughs> she had seen something just from seeing him walk down the driveway. And, uh, she never talked to me the same way after that. <laughs> it, it gets better. Um, before I moved from Ann Arbor to California, a friend came and told me a story he'd heard about Max. He'd heard that Max had miraculously materialized in someone's room. And I thought, this sounds like a story that adoring, idol-worshipping students make up about a professor who they admire. And I, I didn't really believe it. But many years later, I was talking to Max about these kinds of things, and I said, did you ever have an experience like that? And he told me that, in fact, um, one time there had been a, a student who was in a personal crisis, and he was very concerned about the student. And he was thinking very deeply about this student, and he passed out, and he fell down on the ground. And uh, about an hour later, later, he came to, and the next morning, she told him that he had materialized in her room, and it was just as real as if he was actually there. And I thought, well, I guess that's true. That story I heard was true.
And this is a phenomena that is known to advanced yogis and mystics. That this sort of thing happens to people who are in very high spiritual states. And I think it's a sign that Max had achieved great spiritual achievement. I have one more story that I thought about not sharing, but, but I will. Um, toward the end, a couple of years ago, Max told me that the spiritual work that he had remaining in this life was to get over things that had happened to him when he was very young. And he told me a heartbreaking story that when he was three years old, he had been savagely attacked by a pedophile. Uh, and he thought he was going to be killed. Uh, and he prayed that if I get out of this alive, I promise I will spend my life helping people. So as we know, he did get out of it alive, and he did, in fact, spend his life helping people. And I think it's clear that that's the way he would want to be remembered, uh, for helping people. But it, the story put him into perspective for me because I had always felt that there was something broken and wounded in Max. And uh, this explained what it was. Part of him was still trapped at three years old. And when I talked to him about it, he was still panic-stricken over it. He, he couldn't deal with it at all. So it's been very helpful to me to see all the people turn out who love Max and tell their stories of him. And um, I guess that's what I have to say. Thank you. Should I stand over here? Hi, I'm Debbie, Max's youngest daughter. Um, I have a couple things I want to say. One is, one of the things I've missed so deeply the last month is talking politics with my dad. Um, that was something we really enjoyed in these past few weeks. Um, I'm tearing my family to pieces talking about Trump's shenanigans because I can't call my dad. Um, but he was, he was someone who always talked politics with me. He taught me about the civil rights movement, about what he did. He taught me about the Vietnam War. He explained Watergate. My children are less interested in that story. Um, <laughs> and uh, yeah, I have really, really missed him the last few weeks. Um, but I, I mostly want to share how much I appreciated his sense of humor, because I think it was remarkable. Um, there was a time 25 years ago when I was living in Ann Arbor in graduate school. And it was Halloween night. And a knock came on my kitchen door, and I opened it. And there was someone, a man, standing there in a very interesting costume. <laughs> um, some sort of superhero with long underwear and a Speedo bathing suit. And I don't quite remember the shirt, but there was a, a rubber mask that I think was probably Ronald Reagan. <laughs> it was sort of a scary superhero. <laughs> And I said, hi, Dad, great costume. <laughs> and he said, how did you recognize me? <laughs> so that was, that was a pretty hilarious moment. Um, <laughs> yes. Um, so that was just one aspect of his personality that I really, really appreciated and will always remember. I can't remember when I first uh, uh, encountered Max. Uh, it was at the university. Um, we were colleagues. Uh, we shared a deep commitment to justice. Uh, and I was uh, in my uh, early 40s, uh, uh, on the surface, quite successful, um, but inside, uh, very uh, down, very broken. And I knew I needed therapy. Um, and so I thought, well, I don't have any idea about this, and who might uh, make a suggestion uh, to me? And so I uh, thought, well, Max. Um, he knows that I uh, come from a religious background. He knows my commitment to justice. He knows what I do professionally. And, uh, and so we sat down and we talked. And I said, I don't know, Max, what's going on, but it isn't good. And can you make a suggestion? He made a suggestion, and I wound up uh, working with the person that he suggested for about 10 years. And I think about six months after Max made his suggestion, uh, he came to me and said, uh, how are you doing? And I said, well, uh, <laughs> it's not an easy ride, but uh, I, I think I'm going where I need to go. 
And he checked back with me again a couple times. And uh, I said, Max, I said, what's happened to me is I've rediscovered uh, lost memories of a childhood, including abuse. And Max said, uh, can you say a little bit more about that? And a few people I had shared that with uh, never asked the question, <laughs> could you share a little bit more? Uh, but Max did. And uh, he came back to me and he told me about what Alan shared, about what happened to him early in life. And he also told me about growing up in a religious background, a very fundamentalist religious background. I too had grown, in, grown up in a very devout uh, religious background. So we shared something, uh, you know, life is layered. And that early layer uh, is so, so important uh, and often so uh, masked in a variety of ways. Um, and Max has helped so many people. He's a healer of extraordinary quality. He's a spiritual person of extraordinary quality. He's an academic uh, who has done unusual things in a very traditional academic department who often could not understand nor appreciate what he was up to. But Max was also willing to seek help, to reach out. And there are a couple people here today who were a part of something called Touchstone. Doesn't exist anymore in Ann Arbor, but in the early era of the recognition of men as survivors of sexual abuse, quite miraculously through the vision of a social worker in this community. He founded Touchstone, which was support groups for male survivors of early sexual abuse. And, Mac and I, Max and I uh, came to share membership in that very privileged uh, group of people who were able to enter in to recovery. And we also shared the experience of men coming back from war who shared our background and were so damaged that they couldn't continue to live. And some of them were living out of cars. And Max was so able to ask for help to own the struggle around boundaries, uh, for instance. Uh, even into the ending years of his life, uh, he would give me a call and say, hey, you know, I'm doing this and I'm doing that and I'm doing this and I want to do that. I, I can see a way forward. What do you think? And I would say, hey, uh, how about you? What about overload? Uh, what?" What, what's going on here? <laughs> and he was open. He was very open to ask for help. Uh, and uh, we had such, a, such an incredible friendship all around this layer that we don't talk about much in our society. We're getting better at it. It's a layer that affects everything. Fundamental trust, sexuality, ability to love, ability to find a loving divine or spirit as opposed to an authoritarian punishing deity. Um, an incredible man, incredible journey. Many, many gifts. I give thanks to him. I also give thanks to his family because I know uh, being a family person myself, uh, we're always not that easy out of these backgrounds to be a father or to be a husband. So I just am thankful for Max. Uh, I'm Barbara, and I was a colleague of Max's in the residential college. 
in the medical school, and um, <clears throat> I came to know Max as a true yogi. Yeah, he, he really, really is a yogi, was a yogi. Um, but what I want to say here is that I was especially privileged to share his medical journey with him. Uh, I'm a biologist, and, and he is such a curious, brilliant man. I just want to uh, express my appreciation for the joy that he showed, even in learning about his conditions, uh, his difficulties. I mean, questions, papers, molecules, graphs. Max was just into all of it. He wanted to know, and he offered insights left and right. And uh, I, I just want to say that I, I gained so much from him uh, discussing our mutual you know, love of all this kind of thing, which you wouldn't expect from him as a sociologist. But we all know Max, and his interests were vast, and his mind was just so insightful. I don't really have a lot of life experience, but I find that we should all smile remembering Max, because he's just such a wonderful man. I remember once, we were at his house and we were leaving, but I didn't want to leave. I was crying. He gave me this stuffed bear that was smiling. It was just such a sweet gift. My name is Mark and I came to know Max later in life, about uh, 12 years ago through the Michigan Interfaith Power and Light. Um, we discovered uh, mutually that we shared a, um, a, a very intense respect for renewable energy as a catalyst for positive social change. Um, Max uh, learned that I had spent most of my career working in that, and he asked me as a favor if I would teach him and be a, a tutor to him to learn about this technology and, and what it could do. And through that experience of, um, I, don't know if, I don't know if you've ever been on the other side with Max, uh, the, the student side versus the teacher side, but. I came to learn and understand what makes Max such a great teacher and what makes great teachers. It is the fact that they are really great students. And so Max, um, the relationship with Max was intense and he was the best student obviously that I've, I've ever had um, in any, any setting, but he taught me through that experience uh, a, 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 not only a love of learning, but a, a way to go about learning that really changed, changed me and how I look about learning and, and this concept of lifelong learning because with Max, he remained a student with me wanting to learn about this stuff long after his health had reached, a, and demise of his health had reached a point where he couldn't use what he was learning, but the love of the learning. And I, being in this group, I've come to understand that he was probably taking much of what I was talking about with him and actually giving it to others as well. So um, anyway, that's my story with Max. Hi, I'm Eric, and uh, Eric Engel. Um, I've lived in Ann Arbor for about 25, 26 years, and I went to Oberlin College with Debbie, although we weren't particularly close then. Um, when I came to Ann Arbor for graduate school, I was also a Quaker, so I came to the Friends meeting, uh, and I was somewhat athletic, and one of the first things I did was try to form a softball team. I did form a softball team. We, we had a softball team. The Quakers had a softball team for 15 years. We were in the co-rec league here in town. And, you know, um, it was hard sometimes getting players some years. Uh, and I recall approaching Max, who was quite a bit younger. This was the 90s. Um, younger, at least, than now. And, and asking him, hey, would you like to play on the softball team? We can use some outfielders. <laughs> I don't remember what he said, so I don't have any witty memory to share with you. But he said, you know, thank you. Um, maybe I do a better job observing than, than playing on the field. <laughs> so a few years later, I graduated from uh, the School of Social Work at U of M. I was there for graduate school. And um, I had been living in the Quaker community, so you know, if you know the Quakers here, they have a, a uh, sort of a co-op 
and they've had some kind of um, intentional living community attached to, to the meeting for, for decades. And I lived there for four years. And when I moved out, I rented a room in Max's house. I was one of those folks that, you know, there should be like a club that meets. It would be in the West Wing after, you know. Um, and uh, it was great. It was, it was wonderful because I come home every day. And so I was now a young social worker um, doing therapy. And um, it was wonderful to come home and have dinner with him or on weekends have lunch or breakfast. And I heard a lot of stories. And, uh, and I love telling stories. One of the most amazing stories, I'm not going to tell the whole story. I did tell it at meeting uh, a couple of Sundays ago. Um, but I'll, I'll tell an abbreviated version. And I'll say, first of all, that I think the reason that it sticks with me is that, that Max, um, one of the things he gave me was the power of belief, the ability to have hope and to believe. And I think I believe because he believed. You know, I think we're taught, you've got to, at some point, it's got to come from here. You can't rely on other people. But we certainly get help from other people. The fact that, you know, they believe and you were inspired by them, and so you believe. So the, the short version of this is basically that Max traveled to India. He was interested in um, Near Eastern medicine and spirituality. And he witnessed and participated in um, Near Eastern uh, medicines and, and healing, healing practices. That's my understanding. Um, and he was amazed at its power. Without liquid medicines, without injections, without um, you know, scalpels. And he came back to the United States. And my understanding is he tried to practice this himself. And nothing worked. Nothing worked. Or at least not the way it was working in India. And uh, I thought, you know, wow, this is a very depressing story. It's, it's, you know, this is about um, you know, loss of faith and about discovering that you know, something you really, really believed in, had in your heart set it, doesn't work. And he said that um, he was you know, despondent for some time about this. But, but then he realized that it wasn't because the healing didn't work. It was, it was about the people. It was the cultural differences. That it was more about the power of the mind and the mind's willingness to believe in something it's told. And that in one culture, it worked because of that belief in another culture whose story system uh, involved not believing in that particular approach to medicine, it didn't work. Um, and so he, I think he took uh, a lesson away that was actually uplifting because it said so much about the power of the mind. Uh, this, that's one of the more important stories I took away from Max. I hope I've done it justice. I may not have. Um, but. It, it did so much for me in terms of belief, of, uh, of believing in the power of belief as being so important to everything else. Thank you. I know that Quaker worship is not meant to be storytelling, but it does seem so appropriate here for we're all sitting in memory of Max, of our father. I can't say Max, I need to say dad. He was so unique, and his uniqueness was sometimes for us as children difficult, uh, to the extent that he would extract himself from all expectations of society and live his own way, and we were left with society. <laughs> For example, I had the great privilege of doing yoga with my dad from a very early age. We would do yoga classes together, and anyone who was there in those yoga classes with us will remember his moaning. Whenever he would stretch, he would release these incredibly intimate sounding sounds that would embarrass everyone present. But he never ever noticed even when people said things. One day, Debbie and I were on our way to Oklahoma. You know what I'm going to tell? With him at the Detroit airport and our plane was canceled and, or delayed, I believe. We were stuck two hours at uh, Detroit Metro. We were 
teenagers, early teenagers at the time, maybe 12 or 14, something like that. And we almost died because he decided to do yoga in the airport. <laughs> and it, it wasn't like now where everyone knows about yoga. It was in the 70s. And that was just excruciating. But this... <laughs> Of course, this is one of the things they say, your, your greatest weakness is also your greatest strength, or the other way around. His ability to extract himself completely from other people's expectations gave him this brilliance of being able to do things differently, see things differently, to see things in people that no one else saw, and to bring it out of them. It was really a gift to know him as a father, even though we often had moments when it was hard for us to share him with all of you. But today I'm happy to be able to stand here and say I'm so happy that I could share him with you and that he touched so many people the way he touched us. I think we each feel that we had a really unique like, relationship with him, that we had a special relationship with our father. But I suspect that every one of the four of us had that feeling in a different way. So I'm grateful to hear all of your memories as well and all of your words to share with him. And I think he will as well. I'm sure he's somewhere here listening and enjoying every second of it because he really did love to be the center of attention. <laughs> In spite of all this great humility that he managed to show. Just uh, a small bit of music Max and I would share. So in rejoicing for Max, honoring of Max, and also for all of us, our hearts that have been open and opened and opened. I'm just going to make a prayer with a little flute. <laughs> 